My name is Professor Richard Werner. I'm Professor of Banking and Economics. There have been three different theories of how banks work and how they operate for the past century or more. And you, you can find famous economists supporting each of these three theories. And yet there hadn't been any scientific sort of conclusive study um, on the question of, well, okay, which one is true? The one that is currently dominant and is in your textbooks will be taught mostly at the universities and, and even the regulators and the banks themselves are using in a lot of their publications is the financial intermediation theory, which says that each bank is just an intermediary. It gathers deposits and then it makes decisions on how to lend this money. There was another theory called the fractional reserve theory. It says each individual bank is just a financial intermediary that gathers deposits, does the analysis, and then lends to various borrowers. It says that, well, when these banks then interact with each other, collectively something happens and they create money. Now there's a third one, and that's the oldest. And this one says, no, banks are not financial intermediaries. Each individual bank creates money out of nothing when it gives out a loan. The money for the loan that the borrower receives is actually newly created, didn't exist beforehand, and is newly injected in the economy, added to the money supply. You have different people supporting you know, these different theories, but which one is true? I mean, what is the scientific thing to do? It's to do an empirical test. Now, the trouble is to, to conduct a proper empirical test, a scientific test, you need a bank to cooperate with you. I mean, there's no way around that. You have to take a real loan from the bank and you have to actually take the money and you have to be able to look inside the bank and see exactly what it's doing as you take the loan and, and what sort of transactions take place in their accounting, which means now it is obviously in their IT system. I asked the big banks, uh, initially each bank is is very positive and wants to be helpful. A professor wants to study banking. Sure, of course, we can help. But when it became clear that, no, I, I do need to look into your system and actually monitor uh, very carefully and record what you are doing, they are like, oh, hang on. <laughs> you know? And well, there's various reasons being, being told. I mean, there's this, there's, for example, confidentiality. Although, you know, as a researcher, you can get exempted and you sign you know, various statements that you're not going to use any individual customer information, obviously. So these were um, obstacles that seemed more um, excuses because you could overcome them. They did find a small bank in the end that thought, okay, well, why not do this experiment? It was quite representative though, despite this being a small bank, because it was one of the many German cooperative banks that account for actually the largest number of banks uh, in Germany and Europe and they all use the same accounting and IT system. And so it is very representative. And I took out a real loan myself, uh, 200,000 euros. When the bank gives the money to the borrower, that was me, where does it come from? Where is it booked from? What does the accounting look like? What does the internal IT transaction look like? And so the f um, financial intermediation theory says that there should be somehow, I should be using deposits. So there must be some kind of reflection in their recording of deposits. The fractional reserve theory says that you're lending excess reserves. The banks need to have reserves from the central bank or at the central bank that will be used for the new loan. And the credit creation theory says banks create the money out of nothing. You don't need to book or transfer money from anywhere else. And the conclusion was what we found uh, they didn't touch any deposits, they didn't touch any reserves, they didn't even check their reserves. The money was clearly newly created out of nothing and I was credited with it and I could withdraw it because it was now in the system. And so then going through the bank's internal accounting, um, I could show that nothing else was affected and also the accounting of the credit creation theory was precisely followed. So economists will always say, Banks are financial intermediaries. They are deposit-taking institutions that lend money. But at law, the reality is banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. So the law is quite clear on this. Why doesn't the bank take a deposit at law? Because there is no such thing as a bank deposits in law. There isn't. And there are very clear rulings 
that have been unchallenged uh, for for many decades in in England that what what is a bank deposit what we call a bank deposit at law is simply a loan that we give to the bank so banks don't take deposits they take loans from us we lend money to them okay that's the first point but surely banks lend money no banks are in the business of purchasing securities that's what they do and again it's it's clear from a legal perspective because when you sign a loan contract as a borrower at law that's a promissory note that you've issued it's an IOU a debt instrument and the bank will purchase that and put it on the asset side of its balance sheet and when you then get paid in inverted commas the money from from your loan you see, because there's no such thing as a deposit, it's just a record of the bank's liability to, to us. So the bank creates a new record of what it owes the borrower, because of course the borrower is borrowing money. Uh -huh. And um, that will be recorded as what we call a deposit, which actually is just money the bank owes the borrower. And so it's like a fictitious deposit, when really at law, it's an accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract that has been booked as a slightly different type of liability, namely that one that's called a customer deposit. Banks create money out of nothing, and they do this on an individual level. Every loan any bank gives is money creation. That means, that this very important question of how much money is created in the economy and also who gets that money for what purpose all that is decided by the banks for example let's say the banks change their policies well it will have an immediate impact it will essentially over you know a certain time period it will reshape the entire economic landscape um, so that's why it's important to have the right type of banks that make the right type of decisions that are good for the economy and good for people what one could do in the current system already is to encourage the establishment of small banks, local banks, community banks. Uh, secondly, I would scrap the Basel regulations. They give the wrong incentives. They essentially reward banks for lending for property, speculation, and punish banks for lending for productive business investment. Has there ever been a banking crisis based on too much lending to small and medium-sized enterprises? No. There are plenty of banking crises from too much property lending. So it's quite clear that you know um, the incentive structure at the moment of bank regulation is the wrong way around. So I definitely would change that. Uh, certainly would scrap most bank regulation because it just creates massive costs and bureaucracy and makes the banking sector very inefficient and very costly can be very lean and, and contribute to society much better. If we scrap all this, we just need one rule, that banks are only allowed to create credit because that's a public sort of uh, public good, really. The, the power to create money affects everyone, right? So it should only be used if it's a loan to somebody who contributes to the economy, namely productive business investment. So basically lending for consumption by banks should, should be forbidden. And secondly, lending for buying assets should be forbidden because that also doesn't contribute to GDP. So only when there's a contribution to national income with this money creation, then banks should be allowed to do it. Because then also it's safe banking. You can't get another banking crisis anymore. You've abolished banking crisis with that rule because um, productive business investment generates income streams to service and repay the loan, whereas property and consumption lending doesn't. So interest rates, the price of money, should not be centrally planned. The central bank should not intervene there, should be market set. Because anyway, interest rates follow economic growth. They're not really a, a proper monetary policy tool. The banking system should be as uh, decentralized as possible, with as many as possible small local banks. Because then you have the decision-making process you know, delegated to the lowest uh, level in the economy, to the local level, which is the best decision making. I mean, look at China. Under Deng Xiaoping from 1978, China switched from a Soviet system with one bank uh, to thousands of banks. You know, Deng Xiaoping had this, this reform and he understood the power of banks and, and also the, the importance of banks lending for productive business investment. And he created small banks, local banks, community banks, savings banks, regional banks, provincial banks, thousands of banks. And what followed was 40 years of double-digit economic growth. So when you do that, you get high economic growth.
And that's why it's good to have banks. We shouldn't abolish them, but they need to be decentralized, small, local.